Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, we had an RTCC meeting that ran a little long, so we're just uh, getting started here. Um, I'd like to call the OSSD meeting to order at 6.40. Um, we are going to talk about a learning modality um, and where we stand as far as that goes. We're going to get a budget update for uh, next school year, 2022. We're going to talk about um, special ed and elementary sort of uh, end, ends monitoring, how we're doing in those arenas. Um, and amongst other things, so uh, Brian Baker has uh, already agreed to be our meeting evaluator. And we will have several um, opportunities for community discussion, um, questions, etc. We do, um, so we, there will be after various things, after the learning modality, after the budget update, et cetera, there will be a chance for community engagement. If anyone would like to say something right now, um, that's fine too. So I'm going to mute myself. And um, if someone, a member of the public would like to say something to the board right now, that would be fine. All right, hearing none, um, we will proceed. So our first uh, discussion will be about learning modality and Lane Millington, superintendent, is going to talk to us about what he and the other administration officials uh, and cabinet have decided to do as uh, going forward. Lane? Gotcha, give me a moment to get set up. Now this is um, gonna be a similar presentation to those folks that were with me on Thursday, I've updated a little bit of the data um, that goes along with it. Um, we will talk a little bit about the survey data. If folks remember that uh, when we left the meeting um, at the last board meeting, uh, we had kind of this plan in place that we would start planning um, for potential full, full in-person instruction. And one of the parts of the plan was taking a look at some survey data, sending out a survey to kind of see where people's appetite was. And so that's the first part of this. Um, let me see if I can get this going. So board members that are here, can you see? Awesome. All right. The only problem is I won't be able to see my notes that go along with this. A um, couple of things to note here. Shut my speaker off. That are going to be important. Um, is that we actually, we did two surveys. Um, we did a survey in October, we did the same survey again in November. The October survey had a bunch of um, IP addresses in there that had submitted the survey over and over. You expect that a little bit, right? Because if you got you know two parents, um, you have a parent who's also a teacher in the school or you've got kids. First speaker's up. Somebody else has a speaker besides me. I can't find my mic. I don't know where. It usually is usually right. Oh, wait a minute. Nora, can you hear me? Can you hear me when I'm presenting? Yes, I can. Thanks. Yes. Say it again, Nora. Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Just to make sure. <laughs> so, um, again, so we had, did the October survey, we did a November survey. Um, it looked like people were kind of stuck in the ballot box a little bit when you see IP addresses like that. But the interesting thing was it was um, mostly parents. 
And when I had a chance over this weekend to take a closer look at them, we had almost as many stuffing the ballot box for full in-person as we're stuffing it for full, full remote and hybrid. So the data is probably from both months is actually pretty accurate as far as I can tell. Um, the other thing to kind of point out that I think is important is to remember that survey data is just that. It represents what people's desire is right now. It does not necessarily tell us what is wise to do or what is safe to do. Okay. So in terms of the parents, and this is the parents overall, we'll break it out a little bit later by you know what the elementary um, level said, and we'll talk about why we want to look at the elementary a little bit differently. This is the parents in total. Um, you see a couple of changes between October and November. And remember that the November survey went out um, shortly after we did have our positive cases within uh, the high school in a positive case over at Braintree. Um, you see that the full in-person um, went from 55% down to 49%, so a modest change. Um, hybrid, the, the desire for the hybrid schedule um, stayed approximately the same. And the desire for full remote uh, went up 5%. So 5% of the people that were originally for full in-person per pretty much switched over um, to deciding for full remote. And we actually saw that play out after the positive um, cases of COVID. Um, we had a number of uh, parents call up and said, I want my students now um, in full remote. Um, we also had some things that played out um, after that positive uh, those positive cases in terms of the teachers. Um, we had two more resignations um, on paraprofessional staff. Um, and then we had three teachers who legitimately um, had medical conditions that were kind of borderline. So as long as the risks in the school were low, it was safe kind of for them to be, be here. It was minimal risk. But now that we've had the outbreak, you know, are now pursuing um, to be able to go out and to teach remotely. Um, it's expected at least, uh, that this sort of pattern is gonna to continue to happen each time um, we get some positive cases in the school. Um, we will probably see more parents seeking to shift over to going full remote um, and teachers as well who might be on that borderline cusp in terms of um, medical necessity um, to be switching to remote as well. In terms of uh, teacher modality, you know, what they were looking for um, prior to they seem to be very focused in um, on the hybrid schedule and their commitment to the hybrid schedule has not changed despite the positive cases that we had a week or so ago. Um, but in terms of full in-person, um, it went from 21% down to 6%. And this is important because whatever we decide to do in terms of a learning modality, we have to have a willing staff to be able to carry it out. So it's kind of one of the things that, that we're looking at, one of the metrics we're looking at in terms of determining, determining what might be possible. Um, and again, you see the, the rise, you know, the percentage of teachers that would like full remote has actually doubled, right, from 16% to 33%. Students, I'm only throwing this up there um, just because we had a few. We had 24 students in October that uh, had uh done results in the survey um the majority of them want full in person um or full remote hybrid was their least choice um and even though this is a small number of students um that kind of put into the survey this kind of mimics uh what we see when we talk to the students as we're walking through the school the majority of the students do want to be here um raven we did get a couple of responses um on the raven which is a separate program uh, they are full in person. They really can't function um, in any other modality too well. Um, so they're full in person. They will remain full in person. That program serves uh, between 12 and 14 students. Now, taking a look at the elementary only results. And the reason that I broke this out um, by elementary was because we had talked earlier about doing kind of, uh, when the conditions are right, doing kind of a phased in approach. And the students to start with are the younger students because they're the ones that are gonna benefit the most um, from the social, socio-emotional learning that occurs, right? They're the ones that are losing out the most on that if they are not here. So if we take a look at the elementary only results, you see that in terms of full in-person, 
right? About 62, 63% of the parents would like to see those elementary students here. Um, that did not change that much between October and November, one percentage point. So it's probably completely insignificant that change. Um, you'll see that the hybrid didn't change much in the, the percentage of um, parents at the elementary level looking for full remote didn't change that much as either. That was pretty constant. In terms of the teachers, um, those that are looking at the elementary level um, for full in-person, and again, these teachers believe and, and really do want to be back in connection with these kids. That one thing is clear if it's safe to do. Um, but that has declined from 25% in October to 10% in November. And it makes sense because the people that are at the highest risk in these schools are the adults, right? Um, a, lot are, a lot are older, a lot, lot have health conditions or folks at home that they're taking care of or folks that they go home to that are either older or have health conditions. So it makes perfect sense. Um, in terms of the hybrid, you know, they're still pretty committed to that, that hybrid schedule at the elementary level. Now, one of the questions um, that was asked, and I thought it was an important one at the last meeting, um, so we can talk about this in a little bit more detail, is that you know when the cabinet sits down, you know the cabinet is myself, it's the principals, it's the directors, it's the other leadership across the district, and we have these discussions every two two weeks. Is what are the metrics that we're considering? Um, basically, two, right? Is it safe given current conditions, and do we have the staff to support a different modality than the one that we're in? Well, in terms of do we have the staff to safely support it? Remember, right now that only 6% of the district, the staff in the district overall, with 124 staff members putting in on this survey, only 6% said, um, you know, they, they are for full in-person learning. 10% at the elementary, if you just look at the staff at the elementary level alone. Um, and then the second question is, is it wise given current conditions? And so I put this little list together um, that compares where we were the last time we met in October and where we are right now tonight. So when we met in October, we were averaging about three to five cases per day in Vermont. Nobody was in intensive care and there had been no deaths since July. Um, and it was just starting to rise. We talked about the fact that coronaviruses typically start to pick up steam in October and continue to, to pick up steam through February. Right now, cases in Vermont are 25 to 30 people per day um, contracting COVID, 43 on Sunday. And Sunday, if you look across the nation and across the states, Sunday tends to be the day where there are the fewest cases reported, and we had 43. We have folks that are in intensive care. Um, we had four going into the weekend. Um, one of them has died. Um, and that's the first death in Vermont since July. In terms of Vermont schools that had seen um, positive COVID cases, at the time that we met last, last uh, month in October, there were seven schools. This was funny. Thursday morning when I was preparing this presentation for the open forum, there were 23 schools that had reported po uh, positive cases of COVID. By that evening on Thursday, it was up to 30 and today it is up to 32. The two little asterisks that are there is for two reasons. The first is to remind me to tell you that some of those 32 schools have had more than one outbreak. That is not a part of that 32 count. The second reason there's an asterisk there is because the data um, on the website isn't complete. How do I know this? because we had five cases in Randolph. And on the website, it only shows us as having two. So it looks potentially, at least in our case, it's been underreported, you know, the number of cases in the schools. I can't say that that's true for the other schools um, and districts that are out there um, in that posting, but I can say that it is true for ours. In October, when we met, national cases were at 39,000 per day. Um, it's been a little quiet in terms of the COVID front because of the election, but national cases right now are 100,000 plus per day. Today, it was 106,000. Right? Yesterday was actually a little bit more than today, but we've had four or five days over 100,000. 
national deaths per day um, in October was 665 on a rolling seven day average. National deaths per day right now are over a thousand. So again, the question comes back to, do we have the staff and is it wise? Trends in area schools. Um, I have a chance every week or two, every week and sometimes every other week to talk with the other superintendents in the area. There's about 14 of us that meet. Um, and there was a lot of discussion going on, even locally, South Royalton for one, about the fact that when the kids leave for the Thanksgiving holiday, they do not come back. They go into remote session and they stay there until after um, the December break in January and then they'll reassess. I am not suggesting that for us here. I am just saying that this is the discussion in and around the state. There's a lot of worry um, right now about COVID fatigue. People are tired. They're not wearing masks the way they're supposed to. They're traveling when they shouldn't. We've got the holidays and the vacations um, coming up. And I think that's one of the sparks for this discussion. There are two superintendents um, that have recently gone to full in-person um, at the elementary level. And they both had the same comments. The first one was we are hanging by a thread each day because of staffing. And the second one was, it'll just be a matter of time until this collapses um, due to staff attrition. And for those of you who don't know, um, and who weren't a part of uh, the RTCC meeting that just happened, Williamstown, who was next door to us, um, just went into full remote due to conditions in and around the town. Um, and the last piece of information that I'll throw out there is that the governor um, recently extended the order for state workers um, who work from home through March 31st. And so there is a split um, so that people are aware of what is being asked of the schools versus what they are asking of their own state workers. Right? You know, I get that we're different entities, but we're actually a little bit more of a risky population than a lot of the state workers are that work in their office buildings with a lot of space in between. So just information to throw out there for people to take into consideration. Cabinet recommendations. They remain the same as last month, but folks are open um, potentially to full in-person for grades K to two. And again, for us, full in-person means four days. We need three days. We need the two days to let the aerosolized droplets that are floating around in the air if somebody has the infection to settle down. Um, and then one day to go in and wipe it all up. If you go in and you wipe it all up and then they settle, it kind of doesn't do anything any good. So that's the reason for, you know, potentially having those three day weekends, two days, 48 hours to air things out, let the droplets settle, a day to do a deep clean, disinfect them, kill everything that we can before we come back into school on Monday. Now, the reason that these grades are potentially possible um, is because K to two, they're smaller class sizes, right? 12, 14, 15 kids um, per class. Um, we get a problem, and I'll talk about that when it comes down to the square footage of the classrooms, um, when we get to grades three and above. Um, right now, um, the governor and the AOE put out a revised edition um, in terms of the guidelines for operating under COVID that goes into effect on November 16th. So I'm in the middle of writing the next chapter in the, OV the OSSD COVID handbook. Mm -hmm. Two things got really strict. The first thing that got really strict in the new guidance is uh, grade seven and above, there has to be six feet of social distancing. It is not an option anymore. Um, prior to that change, it was an option. Six feet if you can do it, but if you can't, we understand. Now it's six feet. Grades K to six, it's three feet. And so I did some analysis. Um, RES is gonna have the most trouble. Um, and one of the reasons because of that is when that school was built, the state limited the size the classrooms could be. They are actually smaller classrooms. Um, about half the classrooms are 550 square feet. About half the classrooms are 625 square feet. Um, that was the limit set on us by the state when those um, that building was rebuilt. Um, they cheated a little bit. They built some little spaces between the classrooms is kind of a place for, you know, teachers to meet one-on-one -on -one or in, in, or one-on-two with students. Um, but what this means is that even if we're following that three-foot rule, not the six-foot rule, the three-foot rule, 
that's the maximum that we can have in those classrooms. And in the 550 square foot classrooms, you can have one teacher and 11 students. And in the 625 square foot classrooms, you can have one teacher and 14 students. So we are limited um, to who we can bring back equitably. Right now, um, K to two, um, based upon the class sizes in those grades, we can probably pull it off. If we try to go above that, we are gonna be in violation of that, what is now a hard rule in terms of three feet, especially at RES. Um, the other thing to be aware of uh, is that to make this work, we need to order standalone desks for the kids to sit at. In most of those classrooms, their tables, right? It's meant for collaborative learning. Um, doesn't work in this setup. Um, so we've got an order out for desks. And then the final question is if we do this, what would the timing of it be, right? The most reasonable time would be after November 16th when the new guidelines and safety protocols kick in. But then where are we at? We're a week away from Thanksgiving. We've already talked about the fact that a lot of schools around the state are talking about not coming back after Thanksgiving because they can't trust where people may be traveling. So do we do it after Thanksgiving? Do we do it closer to December or do we wait until, um, you know, and the end of second quarter, end of third quarter, I don't know. Again, it's hard to predict because conditions can change. They could get dramatically better. It's all based on probability. They could get dramatically worse. Um, so that's a, a piece that's worthy of discussion. So folks are open to full in-person K to two, uh, but the biggest question is if, you know, board decides that it would like to move forward on this is what should the time be? Just um, to put a finer point on it, and I think this is an important one because I want people to realize this, especially if you're out talking with folks in state or federal government, the support to this district and to most schools at this point in time, I've listed it. As of today, we are 10 months in. We have received one box of a thousand disposable paper masks that was given to us in September. We have received two small boxes of hand sanitizer, which was given us in September. We received a box of 900 cloth masks, which we just got in mid-October. And that's it. That's been our support from state and federal government so far 10 months in. Um, we did, uh, they do have a CARES and ESSER that's set up. We are applying for reimbursement. We don't know when and if we will get that money. Um, hopefully it comes in relatively soon because we're a million dollars in right now in additional costs. Um, the one thing that did come, come through, which I am very pleased about, was from the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, the state did set some of that money aside um, and gave it to Efficiency Vermont to kind of dole out as needed um, to help schools either fix their ventilation if they were having ventilation problems or if you're in a condition like us where ventilation was working the way that it should and well maintained um, to be able to enhance it. Um, so we did apply for the grant. We just signed off on the paperwork on it on Thursday last week for $170,000. Um, the majority of that money is going to go um, to replace the fans in the ventilation systems. Um, when we put those higher degree filters in there that filter out the aerosolized particles, right, it adds pressure in the system. It's hard for the old fans to be able to blow through those filters effectively. So these fans will be upgraded that are coming from this grant. We'll be able to keep up a nice constant stream of air despite the resistance caused by those new, new filters that are in there. There's also some controls that will be going into place to make it a little bit easier to monitor, um, you know, when the, the filters are getting bad um, and need to be replaced and where the air is going. Um, so that is the, the, the one plus so far. So after dumping all that on you, um, Let's see if there's questions or thoughts out there and as well as board discussion and, and everything else that should go with this. Okay, first I'd like to open up questions to the board. Um, do people have questions, comments, anything else that they would like to hear from Lane? And then I'll open up for public comment or question. Um, you said that the um, in the cabinet uh, recommendation that um, the cabinet was open to K through two, four day in person, but what about the staffing of those grades? Yeah. The teachers. This is, um, let me turn my 
I think people can still hear me. So this is actually will be a good test. Um, one of the things that we worry about is let's just say, you know, tomorrow we decided that everybody comes back full in person. We don't know if we did something like that, how many staff would resign, how many staff would call out sick, how many staff would show up with a doctor's note. It's all legitimate. I mean, there's real anxiety around this um, as there should be. Um, the elementary level, they tend, again, it's only four percentage points, they tend to be a little bit more open to the idea of full in person. They recognize the importance of connecting with these kids, especially because the socio-emotional socio learning. And these are smaller classes anyway. They're ones that we can accommodate. Um, we can have the full classes back in those grades and we can accommodate them within the social distancing parameters. Um, so it would be a, a good test at some point in time to try this and see what happens, right? It's a small controlled group. Um, we have enough resources that if something fell apart on one day, you know, we could probably scramble around and try to fill in the holes. Um, so good, good question on the staffing piece. Yeah, just to add on to it, and I don't mean to make light of this, but just those, I, I have, a, you know, a four and a seven-year-old and um, they may be the least risky in one sense, but they're also the least likely to be good at blowing their noses and washing their hands. Um, so I, that's just something that occurs to me that it may be low risk in terms of the spacing and also whether they, they carry it or not, but gosh, they're germy. Yeah, and I'm good. Well, it's it's a good point, but there's there's also another piece out there that, that people may have forgotten or not realized is that last March, March 17th, when, when we went into remote session and most schools um, across the state went into remote session, the youngest students ended up in, in protective bubbles at home, right? They're too young to be running around by themselves. They were mostly at home. They were mostly at home um, this summer. So for somebody to come to me and say that there is definitive research at this point in time, you know, we've had these kids have been in exposure with one enough for long enough for us to really tell that they're at lower risk. They might be, there's good logic behind it, but there might not be. I don't think enough time has passed with them back in school in a condition of full in-person to be able to tell for sure. What the research tells us is that their bodies are so small that they have a hard time. Um, they can't project the virus, right? They don't breathe as hard as an adult does. Um, when they cough, it doesn't travel as far. Um, so that's a part of it. Um, I also, more my personal belief than anything else, especially the little, little kids, their bodies are too small to generate enough of a viral load to really load somebody up with it, right? You gotta, you gotta absorb a certain amount of the virus before you catch it. Um, I think it would take them a lot longer to be able to build up that load in somebody else just because of the size of their bodies. Don't know, just, just some thoughts. Um, that are out there. But again, if people are going to depend on this research that says, yes, these these folks are at lower risk. Yeah, the initial data does say that. But again, there's not a lot of data because these folks were protected right up until the start of the school year and are only now, um, for the most part, um, being exposed to what everyone else has been exposed to you know, just because of their age. So good point. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from board members? Hmm. And sorry about that. Let me turn my microphone back on. My speaker, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Still can't hear you. A little bit better. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Okay. Sorry about that. I was just wondering about sub coverage. So once we've got people in and working fully in person, they may get sick and have to be out. Are we, I know that was an, an issue before. Yeah, it, um, it's still an issue. Again, you know, if we're talking K to two, it is a small pocket. It's a limited size. It may be possible. We don't know until we try. Um, and again, worst case scenario is if it doesn't work, you know, for a day or two, admin and whatnot can scramble around to fill in the holes until we say, nope, we got to convert back. Um, 
And again, I'm not pushing to do it now. I'm just saying it's possible. I, my personal opinion, and again, this is just me. Um, I'm not the decider in this. My personal opinion is that we are probability wise on the cusp of things getting extremely ugly um, for the next couple of months. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I am definitely not pushing it right now, but I do believe that it is a possibility. You know, if this is a place that people want to start, um, then this is the place to start. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment, question, clarification, etc. Nora? Can I jump in? Oh. Chris, did you want to go first? It's, I, I, it's fine. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. I can go after you. All right. <laughs> um, just being too polite, right? <laughs> so, um, Nora Skolnick, uh, teach elementary school at RES, and I, I am one of uh, one of the teachers who is fully remote this year. Um, I had a few things that I wanted to say. Um, one, um, and more in my, my role as the um, one of the presidents of the association, the Education Association, um, we have talked with um, our members um, at quite length, and, and it was the overwhelming feeling of the membership that they did not wish to return to um, full in person or four days a week in person, um, even at the elementary school level, even um, with the lower grades. I, I we completely agree with everything that Lane had had so I think eloquently put into his presentation, and thank you, Lane, for for um, putting all of that together. I, I think the one area that I, I don't know if it's really a disagreement or maybe it's a degree because. Um, is that the K through two teachers, um, from what we have heard when we spoke with them, do not wish to to fully in person at this time. Um, I think we agree completely that, yes, that is the place to start when we do start opening up back up to being um, having more days and have full in person, but now is not the time to be doing that. Um, you know, I was originally going to read, we, we sent a letter to the board and I was going to read all of that uh, again, and I'm happy to do that. But I, I think um, Lane just so eloquently made all of the points that we put out and all of the reasoning behind it. Um, the, the rates are, are, are going up. I mean, 43 in a day, that's almost, I think that's more than what we had when we had the school shut down completely. Um, and, you know, and that's not a, necessarily an aberration that's the trend you know it's regularly 20 um over 20 cases in, in a day when i last looked today i think it was at 23 and that was this morning it could have gone up since then um you know i i think that the understanding is there that yes it's it's you know it may not even be the students who are transmitting it that's not known for sure um, but it, you know that the adults are at risk and you can't have teachers, you're not going to have any education if you don't have the teachers there to teach the, the children. Um, even if you know it's it's half the class, at least they're they're able to maintain that and and the hybrid while it's not what any of us want, it is working given the conditions that we are under that that we're all facing in this pandemic. Um, I also, and I don't have these figures in front of me, but I, I, I question on some of those lower grades. I do know that there are classes um, K through two at RES that have 18, 19, 20 students in them. So those classes would not, you would have to move some of those children around. So you'd be switching who their teachers are. Um, you might potentially have to switch where they're going to schools in order to have the capacity to, to do it. Um, I, I don't have all those specifics, so I don't want to, you know, overstep um, on, on those reasons. Um, but just that this is not the time to be doing this. This is the time that other, as Lane has said, other schools are, are talking about going fully remote. Um, I think we are very lucky to be doing as well as we are doing. And um, and I don't know that it's just even luck. I think it's also due to the care and the planning that has gone into this and, um, and that the hybrid 
is working for given the circumstances that we are all under. Thank you. And I'm I'm actually pipe in too. Um, I, I think we agree more more than you think in terms of the K to two piece. I too am not proposing it for right now. I think it is a very bad idea. Um, the other piece of information that we didn't talk about is you know Orange County, where we live, was always the lowest in the state. You know we were in the lowest state in terms of infection rates, and then we had Orange County. I think if I I might be off by one person. I think in the last four days, we've had seven cases in Orange County. Nine um, when I last looked. Yeah. So it, it is growing. Um, there are, in terms of the um, the K to two, there are students that are, are fully remote that bring the numbers down a little bit, um, you know, from, from, from the higher pieces that, that, that we talked about. And I'm also in agreement, I like the hybrid schedule um, because it is a good balance. I talked last month um, on this idea that the model around the country seems to be this idea is that you know you get everything up and running really well and things were running well in the country for a, a while there there was a nice balance there and then people said okay let's start opening stuff up and they kept opening things up until it blew up in their faces and why do we want to repeat that um, if we have something that's a good balance in terms of risk um, as well as the benefit that the kids are getting right now it seems that that's what we should be maintaining Again, my, my recommendations, my thoughts, but just to pipe in on, on, on what you were saying, Laura. Thanks. Yep. Chris? Hi, uh, Chris Armstrong, elementary school teacher. Um, I have kids in the high school and elementary as well. Um, so I also, I just want to start out by, by applauding, you know, first of all, the decisions of the board up until this point. Lane's leadership and the efforts of the administrators and the teachers that over the summer took what seemed to be an impossible task and have made it so successful to this point. And, and I think I think it's it's amazing. You guys have done an amazing job. A few things that jumped out at me in the in Lane's presentation that um that I want to talk about quickly. Um, one is the kind of the suspicious guidance from the state, as he mentioned, um, that state workers are are being told to work work at home through March 31st, whereas um, we're, we're not only being asked to, to, to stay open or maybe possibly push to, to full in person at times, but also that the guidance has now dropped to three feet um, for, for many of the kids in the building. So, so that, really, that really jumped out at me. Um, and I also, in thinking about that three feet, I don't think that that was known when the surveys went out. So it would be interesting at how that might change survey results in the future. Um, it, if this is a, a somewhere we're going with this and we really want to continue and we are going to keep up these monthly surveys, um, having everybody know that that three feet is now the new guidance for those yeah. younger grades and that going in person K through two might mean going to three feet. Um, I don't know, but I would assume that that would that would possibly change a lot of staff member and student uh, parent opinions. Um, and then just just one other piece about the timing, and it sounds it sounds like like Lane, you're 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 on it too that you don't believe that this is really the time, especially given the holidays and stuff. Um, just on the date though, as you said, like do we wait till after? Do we wait for into December? I think it's hard that we might really, given the incubation period and and when things really start to spread after initial contact, like the Montpelier Montpelier event, we're finding out now. I mean, the numbers have continued to grow and. To, and grow over the last month, right? Um, and given that that incubation period and the fact that then we're walking, then we're going into Christmas and New Year's, um, and not only could that blow up in our face, but people who do decide to visit family members at that time, not knowing that they're sick, if that were to happen, just seems like a really risky timing to be going about it. Um, and then, Lane, I'd like you to just clarify one one thing, and I I think it's just the maybe the way you said it, but when you said it might be a good test um to see how that influences the staffing or something um it almost sounded to me uh, like a little risky if we were to to test this without really knowing what staff thinks um that i know personally that would be a really hard decision if if i was faced with and i had to decide am i going to resign because you mentioned that that some you might get a lot of staff that did resign um if they had to to be in that situation um and I would hope that more thought, more communication would go in 
before we decided that this was like a test run um because that's that that's people's jobs and people's livelihoods and people's lives um so I, I don't think that's what you meant but maybe if you could clarify a little bit on that that um that comment i'd appreciate that yeah like i said there, there are two metrics that we're looking for um is it safe is it wise and do we have the staffing and like i said in the, the last slide you know my recommendations have, have remained unchanged with the um only difference being is that you know we're open to the K K to two when it's appropriate my recommendations at the last meeting were third quarter and again that's thinking about probabilities what we know about coronaviruses where things probably will be but nobody in this environment can predict that far out but for me that is probably the earliest possible especially given how ugly it looks like you know things are going to be now through february um, if it follows the same patterns um, as most coronaviruses it will drop off pretty quick in february so you know you're potentially you know looking at you know march april right um and we'll have to take a look at what the conditions are and what 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 um staffing levels are at that point in time that survey by the way will be done monthly um that that's the intent at this point in time just so we can track you know how emotions and and how people are, are thinking over time and would you would you consider putting in that that three foot piece just just uh, i guess as as we continue that survey, if there is new guidance from the state, maybe maybe a blurb that kind of updates that at what we're really looking at. I know the last time when I filled out that survey, um, I didn't I didn't realize that that would be the case that the K through twos might yep. might be at at the three foot um, distance at that point too. So yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of info that has to go out for the next one. It's not just the they revamp that whole 25 30 page guidance um, piece. Uh, but it's also now we got the winter sport guidance and all that um, most of which if things keep on the the tack that it's going you know before we get to january when they're saying they might might allow the kids to start working on the winter sports if it keeps going the way it's going it's not going to happen i mean it just yeah so a lot of changes yeah no but agreed um and i do communicate out those changes each time um they're done i resend out that handbook and I'll try to put the summaries in of, of the big pieces that have, that, that, that have changed and where to look. So good points. Are there any, any comments for from parents or someone besides staff? Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, Lane, it's a question for you. Um, I'm curious, since we've had so many additional cases in Orange County in the last couple of weeks, um, is there any understanding of where these cases are coming from? And is there any possibility that we're having an increase in spread due to kids that are asymptomatic? Do you know anything about that? I could not give you a answer based on any data. Um, my guess is based upon what we're seeing in the high school um and at the elementary schools is and and you've seen it kind of in my emails is there is a lot of people traveling to hot spots and they're coming back they're not quarantining um we catch a couple couple of weeks sometimes a couple a day right because people post onto social media what they did over the weekend um and have to tell them nope you need to go home and you need to quarantine um, so my guess is you know if i were a betting man in vegas i'd lay my bets down on the fact that um what we're seeing in and around the communities is most likely coming from the traveling um, that's going on in the hot spots and that's you know odds are that's only going to increase as we get closer to the holidays so i don't have a definitive answer but that's the best best i can give you i apologize no that's good thank you someone else Hi, my name is Kathleen Bowden. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Randolph Elementary School. I just want to think about with the three feet guidelines where students would be in the classroom. Um, I would envision that some students would be in the cubby area and close to the bathroom and close to the sink. If we're stretching out 
our whole class. I have a classroom of 15 right now. And that kind of makes me feel uncomfortable um, in the sense that I don't want kids to feel isolated being in the classroom. And I worry that sometimes the way our classrooms are laid out, if we're re respecting state guidelines on that, that we would isolate the students in the classroom. So that's just a concern that I have um, in, in, in the lower grades. Thank you. And, you. and you know as well as I do how hard it is to keep, keep um, the little ones apart, even with the best of intent and, and the best behaved kids. It's, it's almost impossible. Hi, this is Pat Miller, the principal in Braintree. I can add to Kathleen's concern. I know in classrooms, in order to do that, if we brought the K2 kids back, we would need to do away with the rug area where the kids go to sit for a group meeting time. And for little ones, that's really tough. We really need them not sitting at their desks all day long. They're, they're only six years old and so, or five years old even. And so that part of it, I think would be really tough too, because in order to spread them out, we have to take up that area with desks. And it's winter time, so it's not like they can take their break outside that easily. Some good points. Hi, I'm going to jump in now. I'm Julie Hinman. I teach um, third and fourth grade at Randolph Elementary. And I just want to make sure people realize that at the elementary school, the kids have their masks off to eat up to three times a day. And so if you take away the three feet and you have kids eating breakfast, snack, and lunch in the classroom, they could be... Um, it could be an hour a day where kids are without masks in the classroom, and I just feel like that's unacceptable for our staff and the students to have that much exposure because we're eating in the classroom. So I just, I, I'm not sure that this is um, even a good idea to be talking about. If I could just jump in and, and add to, to what Julie just said again, this is Chris Armstrong. I. I I just feel like th th from the beginning, the district has been so adamant about being a six foot district and that has been great. And I've heard Lane say over and over that the state recommendation, the state guidance is the minimum by what we go by. And that if at any point we feel um, mm -hmm. as a district that it needs to be stricter for the safety of our community, then those are the decisions we're gonna make. So I just hope that any decisions that are made are, are made under that that assumption that we, we've all been led to believe. And I think you guys have done a great job with it. Um, I sit back and listen to, to Lane go through the facts and the details on it. And, and he's so knowledgeable about it that I feel that we are in good hands with that. And, and I hope that um, we continue to recognize that state guidance is that minimum and um, and go go by what we we have in our gut. Lane said before, you know, take a gut check, feel what you really think is right. And so I think that that's an important point to consider. Hi, can I jump in? Sarah Richard um, from Braintree. I'm just gonna kind of piggyback on what Pat said. Um, I have seven kids right now, half day, then 14 kids a full day if they do come back. And I think the biggest concern that I have would be for seven, six, seven, eight year olds being at their desk a big majority of the day. Right now, when I have seven kids, we can kind of make do with the room that we have. We can, I can put some at their desk, spaced out appropriately, and then we can kind of spread out on the rug. But if um, you know, we do bring in 14 desks, that would really make up the whole space in my room. Um, and having kids at their desk at the primary age would be really hard. They need to move, they need to wiggle, um, and it would just kind of it make it really hard. And with the cold weather coming, um, we can't get out as much, and we're doing that as much as we can now. But it's going to be harder with the with the cold weather. So that's just my thought. Thank you. Hi. Comments. Hi, this is Lindsay Meyer. I teach um, fifth and sixth at Randolph Elementary. Um, and I just wanted to jump in. I was part of the task force for the elementary over the summer. Um, and in some ways it was actually a fun challenge to really think through how we could make this happen for our students and our community. Um, but it was a ton 
of work to really think it through. Um, and it was work that I was happy to do. And I'm so happy to have the students back that I do. Um, so I would just ask that if at some point we do really think about making this move, that we have um, some real lead time to think it through. But there's everything from, as Julie said, the complications of eating in the room to how many kids you can have at recess safely and, and keep those distances. Um, and so I just, um, I don't know, I just wanted to put in a plug that it really was a lot of hard work and hard thinking and um, hours of sort of moving post-its around and figuring things out. Um, and so when it does come time, which I'm in full agreement is not right now, um, just that we have some lead time to, to do as thorough of a job of planning as we did for this fall. And so what, what, a, what will happen and what is happening, um, again, we're just planning, I mean, just keep our fingers crossed someday. You know, that's, that's, that's the hope that, you know, we, we get back to normal at some point in time. Um, but that new guidance that came out, it's going to fall out in kind of the same way um, it did over the summer that you were involved in. And that's um, the general guidance is there. It goes into the overall handbook. And then that goes to each of the schools for the school-based teams to kind of adapt that to the context in which you live, which you guys did a fantastic job about. And that does take time, um, especially to do, to do it well and to do it right. Um, and again, you know, it's not helpful that the guidance changes as frequently as it does, <laughs> uh, especially especially with all the planning and the purchasing that goes along with it um, at times. So, you know, point well taken, Lindsay. Yep. If I could just pick up on on both Lindsay's point and what you were saying, Lane. This is Tev Kelman. I teach at the high school, um, and. You know, I, th I think in addition to the, the time planning, just we need to think about um, from the experience of, of moving into the hybrid model, the amount of work that it was in, in making the physical transition and then figuring out how to deliver quality education to kids under these circumstances um, was tremendous. And I think it, it was disruptive. And there was a transition period where even with the extra two weeks, um, you know, it was it was a wobbly takeoff, um, and I think that everybody did uh, like an amazing job from from what I've seen um, at pulling it off. But there's a cost to kids learning in any transition, and I think that you know to, to what you were saying, some of the data that you were laying out, Lane, and some of the I think um, responsibly like sober predictions or or possible speculation about um, what the winter might look like we also have to really consider the possibility that we might have to make a transition going the other way and yep. that there's sort of we need to factor in the time that that either of those will will take and what i think would be worst of all for kids would be to have to make a rapid lurching decision um transitioning from one thing to another um and then the, the one other thing i just wanted to say because i think we haven't heard from as many parents tonight but i i know and and i think it's really valid the the um huge struggle that parents are are feeling and um some have certainly also invoked like the the social emotional um damage that that some kids are experiencing from, from, you know, not having this full experience of school. But I think we also, you know, particularly now that we've had people in our community contract the virus and um, deal with that level of trauma, just need to really confront and, and weigh very heavily what that would do to our community to have a member of our school community um, become extremely sick or God forbid, um, die of the virus. So um, not that I have to remind anybody of the gravity of that, but it just also seems like really important to have, um, have that weight on the table, also in terms of the impact on, on kids. Thank you. Well, very good. Hi. Dana here. So I'm listening to all of this. I'm just trying to feed my brain because there's this part of me where I'm a parent at the elementary school and my husband isn't 
hasn't gone back to work yet because he has to homeschool the kids and they're only there half time. So there's that hat I wear, but there's also this special education hat I wear where some of um, you know my students, I am lucky enough to teach 11th and 12th grade where we are back four days a week and it's a small population because um, a lot of students are remote fully. Um, but I have a lot of students that come back in, in special ed that have um, immune compromise, immune compromised disease and they're only allowed to come in because of how small um the school you know student population is so i think about that um and i also think about at the high school the older teachers that we have too that come in because they have to come in and teach math right i'm thinking about um the only math class that is being taught on the 11th and 12th grade level and you know, it scared it scared me when we had the outbreak at the high school um, a couple of weeks ago. So, like whatever we do, I hope we're just very thoughtful and we give like you are doing a lot of time um, to in consideration and knowing that if we bring everyone back in um, at the high school, um, what that would look like in our pod. Because um, I do think the pod system has worked at the high school, um, obviously when um the last the outbreak just happened it it worked very well actually so um that's all i wanted to say Thanks. yeah dana good very good point um at this point based on the numbers and the classroom sizes if all the kids came back we couldn't maintain the six feet um so i have no intention of ever recommending at this point in time that the high school goes back full in person no, not unless something dramatically changes so yeah I know I've spoken before, so I don't want to take someone else's place if, if they wish to speak. Um, one piece that I, I wanted to add, though, is um, I guess an acknowledgement that that we we know that all of this places a burden on the community, and and that it's difficult for for the the parents. Um, you know, the purpose of school shouldn't be childcare, but we understand that that. It, that's also um, necessary in, in our day and age um, for parents to, to be able to work and not having that child care available four days a week is a hardship. Um, I, I guess what my asking uh, of the board is, is to balance that um, with the safety and for all of the reasons that we've laid out before why um, that hardship needs to exist. And that perhaps the the district can be looking to help or to to um, work with other organizations um, to find ways to meet the, those needs that um, have not been in place before. You know, um, schools have taken up a lot of the burden um, in in terms of community needs. Um, this is one burden that we can't take up right now, and and but we need to figure out a way. To help the community with that um, and we should be part of that um, discussion so i don't know if it's helping to um, have child care centers or or with other organizations but somehow to um be, to be working on that um cooperatively um while keeping everybody safe and, and maintaining um for all the reasons we've said before the current status thanks Are there any other parents or community members that would like to speak? I'd like to speak as a parent. Um, my daughter is a kindergartner at Randolph Elementary, um, and she actually has a social anxiety disorder. Um, and so it's sort of imperative that she does go to school. We do have that in-person, you know, social contact piece. However, um, she's also fully aware that we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's tough to even convince her to go sometimes. Um, and I've seen her benefit greatly from the small classroom size. Um, and I, I fear that if we were to go back full time, I mean, if we're in the grocery store and someone gets too close, she's like, mom, they're not, you know, they're not six feet away. And I think it would be really hard for um, 
her in particular, and I think a lot of other kids that I do work with at the school, um, kind of be in that environment where, you know, we have to stress all of this social distancing, physical distancing, um, but then we're kind of like stuffing you all into a classroom. Um, and so I, I see, you know, I see this hybrid is working well. I see a lot of kids benefiting from the small class sizes. And it's, this is a big stress on our kids, uh, as well as us parents and teachers. Um, and I think that, especially thinking about it from the kids' point of view, you know, it could be quite stressful to um, increase their class sizes right now, given everything that they're going through. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Hi, this is Megan O'Toole. My son is an elementary school student at Braintree. And um, at the last board meeting um, in October, uh, Lane, you presented some information uh, regarding student performance data um, that you, and it's, it appeared to be very preliminary data, but you presented it nonetheless, um, indicating that student performance was not really being impacted by the hybrid learning modality. And I was wondering if you have any in, um, updates to that data since you relied on it so heavily during your last presentation? Well, uh, for starters, I didn't rely on it heavily. I just made the off comment that as people were preparing the data for the ends, um, they had said that they were actually surprised about how well the students were doing. And they made the same comment that, um, that Jen just made. Um, and we actually heard that from a couple of the superintendents too that are in the hybrid modality that there is a, a significant amount of benefit to these smaller classes. When you have fewer students, um, you build better personal relationships with them. So we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of behavioral issues that, that we typically experience, especially at the high school level. Um, and those behaviors often get in the way of, of learning, um, not just for the student that's having the behavioral issues, but for, for those that are also exposed to it a little bit. We are gonna be presenting some ENDS data a little bit later tonight, so I hope you can hang around to, to see what that data shows. <clears throat> okay, I see that it's about 7.42 and um, we have a lot of other things to cover. So is there anything different or new that needs to be presented right now? Sorry about that. Gotcha. Okay, hearing none, um, let's just open this up to board discussion. Are we, you know, we've heard a lot of opinions. Um, seems to me that most people are sort of on the same page that we should continue with a hybrid modality. What do you guys think? Is there any reason to veer off the course that we are currently on? I don't think we are. I mean, I, when I, if I'm talking as a parent, I would really want my son back in full time, but then I have to take a step back and as a board member, look at, you know, what's best for everybody around. Um, so it's, it's tough that way to hear, you know, everyone talking about it. But um, so I, I mean, as far as his education, I would really want him back in school because I don't believe he's getting the education that he should. But you have to weigh the risk with the reward, and that's where the question comes in. So, I mean, I, I, I would be hard to be in favor of changing it right now, even though I really personally would like him to be back in school. Other opinions or comments from board members? There we go. Um, this isn't different, but I, I just want to um, say I think it is the responsible and safe and, and community um, minded thing to do to stay as is. And I appreciate that there's work going on in order to make the change um, were that to become uh, possible. But it, I think um, it would be irresponsible of us to vote um, to go into any more in person. 
Anne or Rachel, uh, do either of you have any comments? I want to. I want to just say that it's so very helpful to hear from uh, from our teachers and from our community you members. You. And you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Okay. It's just very helpful to hear from from our teachers and staff, and also from our community members. It's it's hard to make a decision in a vacuum and, and having people's input is very, very helpful. Um, so I just want to thank everybody who's participated so far tonight. And, and I know we didn't hear from a lot of parents, but um, in particular, Megan, thank you for speaking up because I know you're, you're not an educator. Um, and so a lot of people wear two hats or, or more. Um, and it's hard to be the one, you know, kind of the one person or the, the few, one of the few who are, who are not wearing an educator's hat as well, and and give that perspective, and I appreciate it. But all the teachers, thank you. Any other board member comments? Okay, I think we should probably make a motion then and vote on this, seeing as we've decided to take over um, sort of the responsibility for changing modalities. It seems to me like um, maybe we don't need to since we're basically agreed, it seems to me, to continue the hybrid modality for the time being. Is that true? So then therefore we don't need to make a motion. We uh, will just continue to um, operate as is, um, and hopefully we'll be able to remain in the hybrid modality for as long as possible. Um, so great, thank you for everyone for comments. Um, thanks for attending. We do appreciate um, hearing from so many of you and um, it's great to just have the, you know, all these staff members and community members just being part of our meetings, it's great. Um, we do have lots to do tonight, though. So uh, next, we're going to hear from Lane about um, next year's budget. Um, Lane? Set up here. Okay, I got that on. Too many windows to flip through. The big thing is you guys got to tell me if you can see stuff. So do you see the at least a presentation? The only problem with this is I can't see my notes at the same time as I'm presenting, so I'm going to be seeing how much I can remember. Um, now, before we kind of start talking about the budget for next year, or at least what we're planning, um, this was actually one of the simplest budget processes I've been through so far because there's not very much that we are looking for. And that was kind of the plan going into this year. You know, we spent a, a year kind of doing a reset and then a year kind of doing some adjustments. And the community was amazing um, in terms of stepping to the plate uh, to help us um, get to where we needed to go to get the supports in place, especially to go after the ends. Um, and, and, and in our case, you know, the ends uh, for, for me and for the cabinet where the adaptability end as well as three of the foundational knowledge ends. We'll talk a little bit about this as we go through. Um, but the real goal at this point in time is moving towards what we call a level service budget. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, the dollar amount that we ask for every year stays the same. It means that it increases just enough so that we can continue doing what we're doing. Right, because the cost of things go up every year, salaries go up a little bit, so there will be increases, but they will not be anywhere near um, as significant as what the, the the towns were willing to provide for us over the last two years. Um, there are two stressors on this, as as you may know, um, in terms of of as we approach this level service budget goal, um, and one of them is making sure that we're doing what we need to to enhance student safety as we work our way through COVID. Um, by the best predictions out there, and hopefully this doesn't make people too depressed, we are only about a third of the way through. Um, 
we are not half the way through, we're not three quarters, we are about a third of the way through before we get back to something that resembles normal, at least in the school um, environment by the best estimates that are out there right now. And so we got to make sure that we're doing what we have to to keep, keep the safety going. And hopefully over the course of time, as things hopefully springtime, early summer start to wind down, um, you know, we can increase, uh, you know, the, the, the time on learning with the students in the schools. Um, and then the other piece is just making sure that we're continuing to maintain those structures we put in place that is helping us drive towards the strategic ends. Now, there are four strategic ends um, that the cabinet and the district has been working on for the last couple of years, some a little bit longer than others. Um, the first one goes back to the board's adaptability end. Um, and in my case, I interpreted adaptability as looking directly um, at our students on IEPs and on service plans um, to make sure that they are adaptable, they are getting the skills that they need to be able to be successful in their lives without a lot of additional support at some point in time, making sure that we are providing that for them. And so the goal here um, for these students is to decrease the number of students on IEPs um, as a percentage of the overall student population to within 1% of the state and national averages. Okay. Um, what is that? Well, we want the percentage of our overall population of students that are on IEPs to be at 14% or less. Um, we also want to see that over the course of time, student IEPs are becoming less restrictive. And we also want to see over the course of time you know, as, as we're building these structures and we're implementing, we want to see that over the course of time, more and more students are able at some point in their careers to exit their IEPs, meaning that they have developed the skills because of the work that we've done with them, that they can now be independent. We don't need that support. Ah, the 14%? Yes. Yes. Wanna, we can go into a, a big discussion about this is probably isn't the time, um, but a lot of it has to do with structure. There are some students that will always need an IEP, um, but at the very least, that's why there's two goals here, at the very least it should be less restrictive. Right? Instead of spending you know three quarters of your day one-on-one -on -one with a special education teacher, Maybe we've given you the skills so that you can go out and you can be successful in, 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 in four, four of the five of your core classes. You know, so there's, there's that progress. In terms of uh, other OSSDNs, I should have changed this. It should say foundational knowledge. The other three ends that we are working towards is increasing the number of students that are achieving proficiency on ELA and mathematics SBAC and on the, the Vermont Science Assessment, right? And what does that look like? We want at least 70% of our student populations when they take these assessments to be able to hit that proficiency benchmark or higher. That's what we're striving for right now. Now, in reality, um, what No Child Left Behind is always required is that someday that's 100%. But given where we're starting, um, given the fact that we're just now putting the structures in that haven't existed for so long, 70% is a reasonable goal. And when we get there, we can reassess and say, hey, you know what? We've got what we need to keep this ball moving forward. Or you know what? We might need some other structures if we want to push it further. Um, we'll know when we get there and we can take a look at how things are and we can assess at that point in time. So this is what we're potentially looking at. And we'll talk about where the changes come from. Um, remember, at this stage of the game in November, we are only looking at expenditures. We also generate a significant amount of revenue. Uh, we cannot look at the revenue side of things until December because we've got formulas that we're waiting to come in from the state that usually come in the first week of December. Um, last year, they did not come in until late. Um, we weren't able to give you guys those numbers until, until the January meeting. Um, so hopefully they're on time this year. A um, couple of points here, these budgets, um, you know, if you look at 2020, 21, um, in 2021-22, uh, what we are looking at is uh, not just what we get from the state and from local sources, um, but as of a couple of years ago, we also had to put in our grant monies in there that we received from the federal government. So there's about 900,000 in grant monies that adds to those totals um, that does not come from either the education fund or from local taxpayers. 
So it's important to take a look at. The change that we are potentially looking at um, right now, and the majority comes from um, anticipating uh, you know, negotiations of what salary increases will be, um, is $554,000, um, an increase of about 2.69%. Once revenues come in, that number should go down. Okay. Again, we're just looking at, at, at expenditures. That's all we can do at this point in time. In terms of a breakdown of what that $554,000 increase um, encompasses, 62% of it is salary increases in benefits, right? We're going back into another round of negotiations. I think I've done more rounds of negotiations than most superintendents that have been superintendents for 15 or 20 years now, right? Because of the state health care piece. Um, you, you folks as well um, that, are, that are on those teams. But 62% of it is salary and benefits. Um, the next largest chunk is what I am calling other. Um, other encompasses things like we went out and we purchased um, and brought in a whole bunch of different software platforms to help us in terms of when we're remote, right? We're remote a couple of days a week in the hybrid uh, schedule. If we get stuck going back to fully remote, um, those platforms will support us. So a lot of the money that's in that other um, is to support those platforms. Um, there is a little bit of money in there um, that is geared towards uh, some of the structures that we needed. We're looking for a few thousand dollars uh, for a director of guidance and counseling. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that happened during this time of COVID is people's anxiety levels are through the roof. Um, you know, at the at the the national level, when people were talking about the fact that suicides and things are up, they are. Um, so we have um, additional counselors this year, um, and they are going out and doing home visits um, on average of 90 to 120 a month. Um, and so we need somebody to oversee that whole process. Um, we have also expanded our multi-tiered um, support systems, especially at the high school, and somebody to oversee that and assist with that, especially when those supports need to be behavioral. Okay, we got a pretty good structure for the supports that need to be academic, but we need it for behavioral. Um, in terms of the 10%, um, that 10% that's a staff increase, that is for taking our nurse who serves Braintree and Brookfield and making her a full-time nurse so that she is able to spend 50% of her time at Braintree and 50% of her time at Brookfield. It is not a good idea to have students that are diabetic, students that have other health needs, to not have access to a nurse in those buildings at all times if we can manage it. Again, they're smaller schools, that's not reasonable, but the least we could do, especially considering we're probably gonna be dealing with COVID, not just this year, but next year, and maybe a little bit after that, um, to make sure that we've got that person on staff. Um, talked a little bit about the support services. Um, we are looking, um, this is a small amount of money. Um, we are looking um, to expand the support services at the high school. Remember, this is the focus right now. They have a lot of curriculum work that just started up a little bit last year and is going full steam ahead right now. But the problem is, is until that curriculum work is done, we have students in the pipeline that missed out on the benefits of that work who need remedial help. And so this is short time money for a few years to make sure that we are providing the foundational skills for those students um, through the MTSS program so that when they leave us, um, they have the skills as anybody who benefited from the really good curriculum that we're putting in right now. Right? We got pipeline students, and we got the ones that are just gonna benefit from the curriculum work that's happening. We do not wanna forget about those pipeline students. Um, so that's the basic breakdown of that that 554,398 that we're looking at. Um, expectations between now and December. Um, hopefully, we get the formulas we need from the state, and then we'll be able to take a look at the the revenue side. It is expected that this 2.69% increase is going to go down. It's almost assured. Um, but again, right now, all we can look at is expenditures.
Total increase. Nope. Total total increase. So if you take a look at what we're what we had last year, what we're looking for for next year, two point six times. Oh yeah. 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 So again, this is uh this is a, a small you know, I would expect if we get to level service, um two percent ish, give or take a little bit, it's probably the norm. One point six is probably would probably be the average. And so we're almost there. Um just to make sure that we have a backup plan in place um, for a couple of reasons. Um, again, we talked about one, you know, we're a million, million in the hole right now. Most districts are that or worse um, in trying to operate under COVID. There are grants out there that we're all applying to. We're 10 months in, we haven't seen a penny yet. I got to make sure that things balance because the state did not change the law that we have to be in the black at the end of the year. So um, I did confirm this both with the auditors and confirmed it with our legal counsel. We do have the ability to make an operational reserve fund. And I'm gonna ask this board and I'm gonna ask the town um, to vote to put that into place in March. What will happen is we did do our due diligence at the end of, the, end of last year. We have a significant surplus because we saved every penny we could. Um, it should go into that operational reserve fund. And then what we will have is we will have money. The board would have to vote to release it once it's in there um, to cover any shortfalls that are due to COVID. And there's a secondary reason for doing it. Um, and it's not one that is preferential. If we go to a vote on a small budget increase and it fails, whatever money is in that um, operational reserve fund we could choose to use to subsidize next year's budget. Right? So if there's a million bucks in there, after we paid off the COVID piece, we could subsidize the next year's budget by a million dollars, a million dollars less we'd have to be going to the Ed Fund and have to be going to the local taxpayers to pay. The last, again, we worked our tails off. It was 1.1 million. And again, it has to be confirmed by the auditors. The problem, however, with using a surplus um, to get you through a year is the year after you get a double hit, right? So it's preferential not to do that if we can avoid it. So I will go out, you know, my recommendation is to go out with the budget, um, asking for the, the little bit that we need that's in addition. If it fails, then the backup plan is we'll hit the surplus and, and figure it out the year after. Um, and those are things you guys have to discuss because you're the ones that would have to vote on. Um, but that uh, that operational surplus, that operational reserve fund, I think is gonna be critical because we don't know how long this is gonna go on. We don't know what's gonna materialize from the state to help us pay um, these shortfalls. Um, so it would be nice to have it there. The district does not have access to it once it's there, unless the board votes. So it's just like, um, you know, when we came to you for facilities to do the roof, the money sitting in the reserve fund, I can't just go and use it to, um, you know, pay for the roof. I have to come to you. You guys have to consider it. I give you the, the breakdown of what it's gonna cost. I give you the bids um, and then you vote on it. And then once you vote, you know, then it's approved to be able to use for those purposes. Shortest budget presentation you've had from me. Um, questions or thoughts or concerns? So we will vote on this in January or something like that? Uh, so December will be another kind of round. Hopefully we've got the revenue side of things at that point in time. But yes, um, your official vote on the budget is in January at your January board meeting. And that gives us enough time to meet all the, the deadlines and guidelines to get it ready for the March vote in front of the town. Any questions from board members? The only other piece I can add is um, the uh, superintendent's report kind of went into a little bit of detail on what each of those categories of spending were. They kind of spelled out, you know, what the money was. So. 
Yeah, we'll ask you for clarifications at that portion of the meeting. Are there any public comment, any questions or uh, concerns about the budget? I just have one question. This is Chris Armstrong. Um, Lane, could you just talk about the operational reserve fund and what the money can be used for? I know in the past, the town has voted to put it into like a maintenance fund. Is that the exact same thing? Um, I think I asked questions about this before and cert certain funds can be used for certain things. So I just wonder, is the operational reserve fund, what can it be used for? Because it sounded, I think at one point I asked asked somebody, can it can we have like a student education fund where it goes specifically to educational resources and not maintenance? And I was told that there's just legalities on what it can be used for. So the fact that you said that you could use it to subsidize a budget, um, could you just go into a little more detail on how that works? So what it can be used for is determined by the voters. Um, we put an article up for them to vote on that defines what the money can be used for. And once the voters vote on it, it has to be used for those purposes. So in terms of facilities, they left that one fairly general, right? It's a facilities reserve fund. Um, but it's meant for the bigger things um, that, you know, we can't do through the normal budget. So like the roof on Randolph Elementary that got repaired this summer, that came from the facilities, right? Fell under that category. Um, the paving that happened um, around the tech center and behind RUHS, that came from the facilities reserve funds. So as long as um, the board is voting on things that meet the categories that the town voted on and said was okay, we're good to go. So it's all on how we define it um, when it goes into that article. And then, um, you know, if the town votes on it, as long as we stay within those parameters, um, when the board votes to approve these funds for use, we're good to go. So can you just remind me, because I can't remember the exact wording then in, in all of the votes leading up to it. What, what was the wording in the last one where you said we have a surplus for this year? Is, would that, what would that allow us to spend money on this year? And are we going to have the same wording for the next time we vote for it? I, I missed a little bit of of uh, what the question was. Um, typically, the surpluses that we have at the end end of the year, they're typically in the two to three hundred thousand dollar range. Um, a lot of it is due to retirements and then hiring, um, you know, younger teachers that are coming in that are lower on the pay scale. Um, in some cases, it's because uh, the teachers that are coming in, you know, aren't taking the health insurance with us because they're, they've got it with their spouse, as, whereas the person that left was taking the full, you know, family plan. Um, typically, that gets divided um, at the end of each year into the, the current reserve funds that we had. A little bit goes into transportation, helps us replace the buses uh, when they're needed. Um, a good chunk of it goes into facilities um, just to make sure that we are maintaining the buildings and the properties the way, ways that are necessary. We also, um, in anticipation of uh, this changeover that someday will happen, they keep pushing it off and pushing it off, um, we also built a special education reserve fund um, because they are changing the structure of how they fund special education. And we don't know what that impact may be. Um, and so we did put some money into a special education reserve fund. The voters voted that in um, last year. I am going to call this operational reserve, um, which leaves us open to being able to pay for the things that we need to do to keep the district running. Yeah, I think like I think that answered it. There, that definitely um, answered it with the specifics. So. Remote, it would cover things like that. Um, potentially additional staffing if something critical happens and, and we need that. Um, any of the other work that we did to, uh, across the district that supported actual academics, our main mission. Um, you know, that is uh, that would be under that operational fund. Are there any other questions? Okay, hearing none, we're gonna move on to, um, the next thing on our agenda is discussing annual report to voters. Um, thankfully, this is a short, short item. Um, basically, uh, this district submits an annual report. Um, it's 
it's published in the Herald and on our website, et cetera. Uh, typically, the superintendent, the principals all submit reports, and as does the board. Um, usually, I have written that. If anyone would like to write it instead of me, uh, that would be great, but they don't have to. So um, I will take <laughs> any volunteer uh, suggestions um, if, any, if any board member would like to, to write the annual report. Uh, otherwise, basically, someone will write it, we'll send it out for comment to one another just to make sure everyone agrees with the tone and and everything that's included in it, and then um, it will be published. Um, if no one want, else wants to do it, I will do it. Um, so you can let me know if, if, it, if it's a top of your list. <laughs> um, that would be great. About a page and a half or something. Yeah, usually about a page and a half. Um, uh, next, we've got the approval of the Title IX policy. This is a federal policy um, that is required. This is our second reading of this. Are there any questions um, about this policy? Anything that's included in it? If not, um, I would like a motion to approve the, the federal Title IX policy as written. I make a motion we approve the federal um, policy as written. Second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, um, we've approved the Title IX policy. Next, we have two reports. These are also second reads. Um, these are Lane's uh, monitoring ports, uh, 2.1 and 2.2. Um, we looked at these last month. Um, it's the students' uh, treatment of parents and students and treat treatment of staff. Um, are there any questions uh, for Lane about these reports? Then do I have a motion to approve uh, EL reports 2.1 and 2.2? I move that we... Um... Is there a second? second? All those in favor, please wave or say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, next, we've got um, another presentation from Lane on uh, the special education and uh, the elementary school performance. Uh, so I'll turn up my, if you turn yours down, I'll turn mine up, or do you want to keep yours on? Gotcha. Just in case there's questions that come in. All right. For some reason, you can't go to present now. If you have it, of course, you'll be open. Again, I don't have access to my notes, which is fine. I remember most of it anyway, but sometimes there's some special things I want to make sure that I, I point out. Um, trying to think of where to start. So this is actually one of the ends, um, one of the four ends that we've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, it relates back to the board's adaptability end, like um, I said a little bit earlier. Um, this one focuses specifically on special education. Um, right. If the students are adaptable, then at some point in time, the hope is, is that we're able to provide them with what they need to eventually move off of their individualized education plans um, and be able to be self-sufficient. Um, so the goal is to move towards that self-sufficiency. And we talked a little bit um, about what that end's goal was, um, as uh, I interpreted it with the special education department about two years ago now. Um, one of the big things um, to recognize is that you know we really did and do need to improve the delivery of special education services. Um, we've talked about this in separate meetings where you know the the national and the state average for the percentage of students on IEPs in a district is around 14 percent. We're currently at 23 percent and rising by one percent per year. Right? 
And we've talked a little bit about the budget impact that that has. Uh, that's an enormous amount of money that we are spending um, for a good end, um, but it doesn't really seem like we're getting a return on the investment for the amount that we spend. That budget has um, jumped in, in recent years anywhere from uh, 14 to uh, 17 percent. Um, this year, that increase is at 9 percent. Um, so that's actually a good thing in terms of the budget. It's actually below the state average. State average um, increase for special ed in the district is about 14 as well. 14 seems to be the magic number for special education for some reason. Um, but again, our goals here um, are a couple of things. We want the number of students on IEPs um, to go down. And we want that to continue until at least we get to the state or the national average. We also want to see that students and I, their IEPs are becoming less restrictive over time, right? We don't need as many services um, to continue um, to perform at a high level. And then we would hope to see that there are a number of students um, acquiring the skills necessary because of the services that we're providing um, to be able to exit their IEPs at some point in time during their careers with us. Now, The one that's more difficult to measure is the one that we spent about a year working on with the special education team. This idea that over the course of time, a student that's on an IEP who is receiving services, those services should lead that student to be in a less restrictive environment, should lead to a reduction in the services that are required to allow that, that student to successfully access uh, the curriculum the school has to offer. How the team approached this, and it was awesome to watch them work, um, is they developed a, a rubric with scores that range from one to five. One is the least restrictive, right, IEP that you can be on. A five is the most restrictive. And these rubrics were heavily weighted um, towards the total time each week the student spends receiving services, okay? Because the logic being, right, as you get better, you need a fewer, fewer minutes, fewer hours, um, receiving services each week, um, and that means that you're approaching a, a less restrictive IEP. Um, in terms of looking like, at data like this, there are two things that we would expect to see if the services we are providing are successful. And remember, we have just spent, this is the first year of it, we spent last year developing a new plan, a new way of delivering services um, to students at the elementary level. And so this collection of data is going to be important over time because it's going to give us feedback uh, to be able to tell us whether or not what we're doing is working, um, right? It's achieving the goals that we've set for ourselves. Now, once we get some longitudinal data, right, because what you're going to see today is baseline data. It's the first year um, of, of taking a look. Um, we would expect to see two things if conditions are improving. Um, the first deals with what we call cross cohorts. So if you take a look at the average uh, rubric score of the students in third grade and the average scores of the students in fourth grade, right, across cohorts, they're not the same kids in fifth grade and sixth grade. What you would hope to see is that over the course of time in general, you would hope to see the rubric scores go down, right? Because the logic being, and again, not always true, but in general, on average, the logic being is that the higher grade the student is in, the more years potentially of services that they have received. And therefore, we should be seeing a bigger impact later on down the line, okay? So you should expect to see things start out high and go low. That's with cross cohorts. In terms of same cohort, so if we take the students that are in third grade this year, and compare their average rubric scores to when they're in fourth grade in the next year and in fifth grade the next year, again, you should see those rubric scores going down, right? One, one means least restrictive because, right, they're getting services for an extended period of time. If those services are doing what they're supposed to, the students should be improving. They should be moving towards a, a less restrictive IEP. Does that make a little bit of sense? A lot of, a lot of jibber jabber, but it's important jibber jabber. So, they did a lot of work last year, and we'll talk a little bit about this data, what it means, what it tells us, what it doesn't tell us. Um, so last year, they had not started the new process yet, the new service delivery model. That began this year. 
So what we're taking a look at is the students um, at the end of last year, right? where they were, what their average rubric scores were. Um, what you see is something kind of interesting here. If you take a look at that line, it's pretty flat. Right? There's a trend line that's in there. You know, you got some some cohorts that you know are doing a little bit better than others. That's to be expected when you're looking across different populations. But as you go from from uh, number one there, which is uh, pre-kindergarten, right, preschool. Number two is kindergarten. Number three is first grade. Number four is second grade. Right, goes all the way up through twelfth grade. We don't really see anything decreasing. Do we? Things aren't getting worse, but they certainly aren't getting better either. Ah, but we got to bring some other data in into there in terms of students that may be moving out of the district at that point in time. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but you would expect to see the overall, but you see that trend line that goes right down the middle, right? It's almost flat. It's actually rising a little bit. So you go with what the trends tell you. Um, it actually means that it's either flat or it's getting a, little, a hair worse. I mean, in, in infinitesimally um, small, but but maybe a hair worse. So we're basically maintaining. So despite all this money we're spending, despite all these services that we're providing, for whatever reason, it is not having the desired impact. Okay? So that's the old money. What we're hoping is that in two or three years, when we look at this data. Um, and right now we only have the cross cohort. We can't look at the the, the within cohort um, because, right, we, we need multiple years to do that. Um, what we hope to see is that that trend line starts to do this. Sure. So, so how how does trend line determined? How does what trend line determined? So, and of course we both got our speakers on it. There we go. Um, the trend line, it's mathematically averaging out the highs and the lows, right? You got some that are high, you got some that are low, so it's finding the, the midpoint. It's averaging out that data to see what, what it's doing in general. And so what that trend line is telling you is that it's flat, right? Yeah, you got a lot of scatter there, um, but the trend line is pretty flat. So there's no real improvement, assuming, obviously, that this measurement has meaning, which we do believe it does. I guess what, the reason I asked that was it looks to me like the later grades would be lower than the earlier or in the middle grades, which are definitely higher. Yep. But if you take a look at this, for your, you've got the younger grades that are on the low side, the higher grades that are a little on the low side, but you got all those, those grades equal amount um, that are on the high side between grades uh, between grades six and 11 by the looks of it. Okay, so they do average each other out. So if you wanted to break the trend line down a little bit, so let's let's look from one, which is pre-K to two, three, four, right? So that's from pre-K to grade two. You see that if we did a trend line there, it would definitely be rising and rising a lot. And then if you looked at, you know, nine through 14, which is the middle school, the high school years, yes, it is decreasing. So you could chunk it out and break it down by, by, by different, uh, different schools and whatnot, which we didn't do. Now it gets a little tricky too. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this when we look at the next chart here. It has to do when you would expect to actually identify students in that are in need of services um, students that have a disability it's a disability it's there it's not like it comes and goes um, in most cases and so hopefully most students are getting identified early um, and we're going to take a look at a chart in a minute that'll show you where we're identifying our students but this idea, um, one of the other measurements that we're looking at, an increasing number of students acquire the skills necessary to exit their IEPs each year. Well, if we take a look at what's happening in terms of students that are entering IEPs and students that are exit, exiting their IEPs, this is how it breaks down. Um, last year, 1920, over the course of that year, we lost 24 students that were on IEPs. 
12 moved, at, moved out of the district, so we can't say too much about them. 12 were moved off of their IEPs. That's something that we can say, yeah, we had an impact on these kids, and so they no longer needed those services so that there were 12. And of those 12, 11 of them were moved off prior to grade seven, which again, we're reading a little bit into the data, means that the disabilities that they had probably were not that severe. On the other hand, we gained 52 IEP students last year. 15 moved into the district. We have no control over that. They came in with their IEPs. 37, however, were found eligible as students here. Nearly half of those 37 students were found eligible during preschool. And the majority of those were speech and language. And we'll talk a little bit, that's something we might want to talk a little bit about in executive session, um, but there's some things that should be said about that. So we had a net gain last year of 25. Right? 12 were moved off, 37 came on. When are students found eligible? Well, this actually is a pretty good pattern here. This is a positive piece of data. You want to identify students early, right? Because the sooner you can identify them, the sooner you can begin work before the academics become incredibly difficult and incredibly hard and hopefully remediate the, the problems before they get there. Make them self-sufficient, give them the skills and the strategies they need that when they encounter um, the problems that, that are a manifestation of their disability, they know how to overcome them on their own. You know, that's that's the goal of, of, of a good special education program. So you see pre-K, you know, we identified 16. Kindergarten, we identified three. Grade one, we identified five, right? You see this cluster in the early grades, but you also see something interesting on the other end, right? The question becomes is why are we identifying students for IEPs in grade eight, grade 10, and grade 11? Now, Again, it's just one year's worth of data. Um, there could be a very good reason for it. There could be bad reasons for it. The possible bad reason is, is that these are students that had problems all along and somebody should have identified them a whole heck of a lot earlier. The good reason, um, and this one's a little bit more difficult, see if I can explain it well, is a lot of students, especially with um, disabilities that are kind of low grade, um, what will happen is they'll internally all on their own, they'll develop their own compensatory skills, right? They'll be able to handle their disability in most situations. But the problem is, is as they advance through the grades in school, the work gets harder. And eventually after enough years have passed by and the work is getting increasingly harder, all of a sudden they hit a year with a compensatory compensatory skills just aren't good enough to get them through the new difficulty they're encountering with the material. So you do get a small population that pops up later on. It should be a very small population, one or two. Um, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So is that good, bad? Right now, I'm gonna say it's probably good. These are probably students without knowing the students directly. These are probably students that had really good compensatory skills that they learned on their own. When they got to these higher grades, um, things just became difficult enough that those skills couldn't carry them through anymore and they needed the extra help. Um, it's really sad when you pick, pick up on it in grade 11 because you don't have a lot of time to work with the students before they go out potentially and encounter the really difficult work in college. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we might talk about depending upon how this chart changes um, over time is, you know, do we need to have some additional screening methods that all students go through just to see if we're picking stuff up and dealing with it as early as possible, which a lot of schools to do. Um, so, again, it's a beginning. Um, takes three years to establish a trend, um, but we've got a plan, we've got goals, we've got what we're working towards. They're reasonable and they're worthy. That's important. They meet the board's ends in terms of adaptability, the way that we've chosen to interpret them. And we've got the data that's going to help us inform what we're doing, whether or not the new model that we're putting into place is successful. So questions on any of this? 
And we're going to learn a lot more as we do this. There's a lot more data. Once we get two or three years of data, there's a lot more really cool things we'll be able to look at that we can't look at again. So there are, are there any questions from either board members or public? All right, we'll move on to the next part of uh, the ENDS monitoring presentation, which is about uh, elementary ELA, is that correct? Yeah, so one of the difficulties we had this year, um, typically October-ish, you know, we sit down, we look at the, the SBAC data, because that's what I tied a lot of the ENDS to. We look at SATs, ACTs, that sort of stuff. A lot of that stuff didn't happen last year. And right now we got notification on Thursday of last week that the state is trying to get a waiver so it doesn't happen again this year. Um, whether or not that'll pass, I don't know, um, but that's what they're going for. Um, so we've kind of broken things down into two. We'll take a look at some elementary data that we've been able to um, gather through Track My Progress. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that is and why we're using it. Um, and then next month, hopefully the high school data will be here because they just started a new program called STARS 360 that they gather their assessment data. Um, so let's take a look at what it's telling us. And I do, before we kind of switch over to the other presentation, just my kudos out to the um, special education team. Um, they did a tremendous amount of work creating the cohort. They actually went in and reprogrammed the software they used to track student IEPs and um, build in a database section so that every time they are reevaluating an IEP, they are putting in the new rubric score so that it can be tracked over time, both collectively and by individual students so that they've got that data as they do their work. So they did a really, really good job. All right, let's see if I can remember all the parts and pieces of this as we get later into the night here. Uh, If I begin to get nonsensical, tell me. All right, so can you guys see that? Um, and I don't have my speaker on, so I'll let you turn yours up in case questions pop up. So, well, maybe that won't work. <laughs> Nobody can ask questions until I'm done, then. <laughs> and I can always flip back through the slides. So a couple of things to, to remember as we kind of look at this. Um, first thing, uh, we just kind of talked about this. SBAC was not administered last year, right? So 1920, uh, so 1819 school year was the last year that we had SBAC data. Um, right now, like I said, the state is trying to get out of it. It's applying to the federal government for a waiver to not have to do the state testing again. Um, I don't think the federal government's going to let them get away with it. Um, the money that we receive um, from the federal government, our title funds, about the 900000 a year, comes from the state receiving money from the federal government because we are accountable and we are held accountable through this testing. Okay, so without the testing, you don't get the money. Um, the students, um, and this is an important thing to remember when we get to the math discussion, um, the students transitioned to fully remote learning on March 17th of 2020. And I did the, the mathematics of it. I took a look at the number of days that they spent in fully remote session when that happened. They spent 40% of the school year last year in terms of student days um, in fully remote. Okay, so pretty significant chunk of the school year. Um, in that modality. And it wasn't the smoothest of all switches, right? We had like three days notice when the state came down and said, you're gonna do this, so figure it out, um, which I give the staff a lot of credit. They did a pretty incredible job. Um, in terms of the two, because we will look at data from both, we'll look at the old SBAC data and then we'll look at the Track My Progress um, data. In terms of the two, they're measuring the same things. They're both tied to the Common Core Standards. So they're measuring how students are doing um, relative to the standards of the Common Core. Um, what we've noticed, however, is that students tend to score a little bit lower, about five percentage points lower on Track My Progress than they do on the equivalent SBAC. 
Okay, we've only had one year that we could do that sort of a comparison, but that seemed to be what fell out of it. Um, because of this, it's hard to, to look at things in terms of absolutes. Oh yeah, they got 50 50% 50 on uh, on SBAC and 45% on on track my progress. So that was defined well. Not really, because there's a five point shift there. So trying to compare things in an absolute term is not a good idea with this data. What is a good idea is to look at the trends. SBAC, were they getting better over time? Track my progress, were they getting better over time? Because that has, that has meaning to us with the data that we have. Um, a couple of things about the work that we have been doing um, within the district. Um, ELA efforts started before I arrived. That's important to know. Um, they had done some, some uh, gotten the curriculums hammered out. Um, the real work of uh, folks taking a look at teaching um, and delivery and whether or not it was effective using assessment data that happened while I was here. So ELA has had the, the at the elementary level has had the longest amount of work done on it. Math started a year or so later, year and a half later um, at the elementary level and science is just beginning K to 12. Um, RUHS, remember they were stuck for those first couple of years. They were working on um, proficiency-based graduation requirements and standards-based report cards. Those were state mandates. So that took up all their time. They started doing a little bit of work on the curriculum last year, and then it really kicked into full gear this year when the budget passed, because um, we needed to put those structures in place. Um, comparison, we're gonna take a look at data. Um, we're gonna take a look at the spring SBAC data. And we're going to compare it to the fall track my progress um, data. And there's a couple of things that you need to know about this. SBAC is given in the springtime. It's given at the end of a course. So if I'm taking my um, taking you know my science um, SBAC, it happens at the end of the year after I've had a full year of the course, right then and there at the end, or pretty darn close to the end. So the students are really familiar with the material. Track my progress, on the other hand, um, because of how things uh, worked, the data that you're going to be seeing, because it's the only data that I had three years of, you are going to be seeing what's called the fall data. So that means these students went over the summer, had whatever gains and losses happen over the summer because they're not working um, with the material. They came in, in the fall and late September, early October took the track my progress test and that's where these scores came from. So three, three years in the fall. Okay, does that make sense? So again, a little bit, little bit different in, in what, what we're looking at. This is why the trends are important. So if we go back to the last three years of um, SBAC data um, for students in English language arts, what this chart is showing you, it is telling you the percentage of students across the elementary grades, all the grades together in a big weighted average, the percentage of students that hit the proficiency threshold are higher. So if you look at uh, 2017 there, um, that dot, it's about 46%. That means that of all the students in grades, actually if it's SBAC, it's grades three to six, um, of all those students combined together, when you average it out, about 46% of them hit the proficiency threshold. And what you'll see happened as we started doing this work, you see that trend line going up, that work was having an impact. Not only was it having an impact, but we got the slope of the line down there at 4.3, right? Y equals 4.3X. What the slope of that line is telling us that is over the course of those three years, every year that went by, 4.3% more students achieved proficiency than the years before. Okay. So it was increasing. Now, let's switch over to elementary, track my progress. There is one year in common. Right, so the SBAC goes from 2017 to 2019. That's the three years we're looking at. The track my progress, again, taken in the fall, goes from 2019 to 2021. So 2019 is in common to both. Again, you can't really compare absolutes, but even if you did in this case, it would still look pretty good. Over those three years, 
not only was it increasing, but it was increasing at a faster rate than the S factor. Okay. We, we so every year, yet. it goes by 5.43% more students are achieving proficiency than the year before. So these three years here, and then these three years after, we're looking at these here now. So not only are they still improving, but their rate at how fast they're improving is accelerating, which is a good thing. It's what we want. And that's taken into account that 2021 dot that you see dropped. That's this fall. That's after students spent 40% of their year in remote session last year. Okay, that's in the average as well. So rate of improvement in ELA for SBAC, it was going up at 4.3% per year because of the work that folks were engaged in. The following three years, including the horrible year with the, the fully remote learning, it was improving at an accelerated rate. So questions on ELA? Elementary math, again, this started out a year, year and a half after. Wait, Lane, I have a quick question on the on the the only thing I can see is the presentation, so you'll have to turn it on for me. Are you there? Yes, you have can a you question. Hear me? Well, I'm just curious. Um the track my progress, that's only given in the fall. And but the year you had there was 2021. We're not even into 2021 yet. So is it just labeled by the end of what the end of the school year will be? Okay. Yeah, you, you that is correct. So it's labeled by the end year. Um, the other thing about track my progress is it's actually given multiple times a year. It's given fall, okay. winter, spring, and summer. Cool. The so are we going to have that data? Fall, was because that's actually number one, that's the worst data. The kids actually get better if you look at how right. they progress through the course of the year, right? Because they got more of the course under their belt. Um, but it's also, it was the only data that I had three three years worth of, right? Uh -huh. I had one, I had two sets of winter data, which is even better than this. And then I only had one set of summer data because of how things fell out with, with uh, COVID. I um, so I, I chose this one just because I had three years. Um, I believe in trends, right? Things mm -hmm. can change from year to year, but when you get three years, you can call it a trend and it, it makes a little bit more meaning um, when you look at the statistics of how things change. So good question. So that will be better data than the SBAC overall because it's given more frequently, right? Yeah, it serves um, it serves a little different purpose too. Um, part of this restructuring, it's not just about building um, a curriculum that's tied to the common core. The teachers have to be able to, in real time, assess the students and get feedback on how they're learning what is being taught right now. Because if they get that feedback and they realize the kids aren't getting it, that's when they pull together with their departments and have the discussion and saying, hey, my kids aren't getting it, are yours? And if the teacher says, well, mine are getting it really well, they share ideas on how it was taught and that teacher goes back and re reteaches it. If the department gets together and they all say, no, our kids are doing equally poorly, no matter what we do, then that's probably a place where we want to build in some professional development in that content area for those standards. So that's that when I talk about informed instruction, that's the process that we're talking about, collecting data, real time, seeing what it's telling us about how the kids are doing um, relative to the standards and being able to adjust what you're doing right then and there to make things better if they're not meeting the standards the way that you want them to. Right. Awesome. And Track My Progress is really good at that. That's why we adopted it. I'll, I'll just say that I like, I like the positivity that you're having with this. But if you look at your trend, trend line, I mean, we're blaming that last, you know, that dip at the end on COVID last year. But this year, I mean, if it comes in basically the same, we're on a negative trend line. Yeah. Quick. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, I like the positivity, but, you know. So the, the good question, because we, we what, can't what be if, negative just as quickly as we're positive. Well, remember, you've got, you've got five years of a positive trend line, and you've got a dip, right? Because you've got the S back years, and now you've got two years of the, the 
the uh, track my progress here as a deposit, and you got the thing that happened in COVID. So can I guarantee it was COVID? No, but that's the logical explanation. Okay, I was just, I heard you say that you only had two or three years of information. That's why I was kind of- Yeah, so three that. years of best back, and now we're looking at three years of track my progress that you can put together. Now, what's gonna be interesting is when the winter data comes out, because what that's gonna give us an indication of is now that we're living in this time of COVID, how good is that hybrid? Was it better than the remote? Was it not? So when we see the, the trend difference between the fall administration and the winter administration, that's gonna give us some indication. And that's gonna be real important in data, especially as we're getting closer to the springtime of saying, should we be going back to full in person or not? Are the conditions good enough? If the scores are really low that, yeah, we really should be doing this because it's better for kids. Or if the scores are actually pretty good, maybe not where we want them, but conditions are still kind of mediocre or crappy, you know, that, that goes into the decision-making process that we're all gonna have to do. So very, very good. Um, I appreciate it. It makes it feel like people are paying attention. <laughs> uh, um, all right, elementary math SBAC. Remember they started their work a little bit after the ELA, but they, they really threw themselves into it. Um, they had a wonderful person on staff who actually trained them in three different um, classes that were related to teaching under the Common Core, um, because part of it is how you teach it, um, not just what it is the students are supposed to learn. And this is a really cool line um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's going up. So, hey, yay, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to. Um, and it's going up by more than 3% a year, which means that it's because of what we're doing. Usually the error is anywhere in the 3% plus or minus range. So since we're above that in all these cases, it means it's because of what we're doing that's causing the change. But if you look at this line, you'll see that the, um, the data points are on the trend line. That's a really good thing. Yeah. yeah, this one's really good and usually, if, if, if other conditions in the world don't change, when you see that, it means you got a couple more years of that before things might fall apart. So we had, so this is under SBAC, we had three really good years. Now you're gonna see the impact of COVID and math. Um, so you see that there's two really good years, right? That trend line continued. And all of a sudden that 2020 to 2021, that 40% of time that those kids spent in the remote session, again, I'm using the best, What's most logical, it fell and it fell hard. If we took a look at just, if we if we removed that, what we would call this out of whack data point because of COVID and you saw that trend line, it was actually rising a little bit faster the last two years than it was the three years prior to on, on the SBAC. Um, so again, we had this huge drop and this kind of makes sense, this is math. Um, ELA is complex and there's lots of parts and pieces to it, but anytime you engage in reading and writing, you're using the majority of the skills you're learning. That doesn't quite work that way. There are standards I learn here that I need to build on here, but there are also things I learned that I just learned here and I'm probably not going to build on them again in the future. And so if they're not doing it every day consistently, that's why math is one of those courses you don't like to see in a, in a rotating schedule. You don't like to see them skipping days for math. It's one of those things, they need a chunk of it every day to do successful. Math hit us hard in terms of COVID when it happened. And we're, we'll, yeah, we're gonna, we'll talk about the recommendations. They're actually already implementing them. Um, and it's a part of that that budget piece. When you go back and you look at the budget, remember we had some money that was set aside for those additional services. That's what it's for. We can't change the modality we're in, but we can have those kids that are struggling in math that track my progress and Stars 360 is identified, have them come in four days a week to get some extra help and extra one-on-one -on -one time in math. That's the goal. With COVID? Well, there's there, there there's there's a reason the state's trying to avoid doing the testing again this year because it knows what it's going to show. Okay. 
Because we have a responsibility to get 100% of those kids across that proficiency threshold at some point in time. I mean, it's, I think it's more than it, the, their decision this year. It's it's there, there's more to it than COVID because we're all up and we're all running in one form or another, and we're actually running fairly smoothly. Um, so there's really no reason not to do the SBEC. I think they're afraid to see what the results are. Um, so rate of improvement, um, the last three years of SBAC, it was going up 4.2% um, more students per year were crossing the, the proficiency threshold across the elementary levels. Um, the following three years, if you look at the three-year trends, um, it's down 2.37, right? Because of that big hit, it took that COVID year when we went to remote session. But if you throw out that, sometimes you do that, right? If you got nice data and you got some that's here and there, you throw out the bad stuff because you don't know why it's bad. Um, what would have happened during that two-year period is it actually would have increased to 4.5. Right? If you threw out that one, 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 one year with COVID. So things were doing what they were supposed to and we're, what we were putting our money and our efforts into. Hopefully in two or three years, you're gonna be seeing the same thing like this out of the high school. That's the goal. So summary findings on this, um, ELA should continue doing what it's doing, right? Um, the biggest kind of changeover where they're at in this process is making sure that the grade teams are becoming um, self-sufficient in both collecting the data and using it to have those, those deep discussions about informed instruction. This is what the data is telling us. This is where we know the kids are hurting. This, as the educational professionals, are what we're gonna do differently when we go and we teach those lessons in the future um, to connect with them. So that's, that's kind of where they're at. Mathematics needs to continue its current efforts, um, but they really do need to remediate the impact of remote learning, right? That remote learning, we took a hit in mathematics uh, across the elementary schools. And part of the reason for doing this Track My Progress testing was to get this information, was to tell us what they missed so that when we started this year, first thing we did was took a look at least what the foundational standards were that they missed, taught those first before we moved into the new, new curriculum. So that's what's supposed to be happening right now. Um, and then the other thing that they need to do, and we'll get the data in, 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 in winter, um, is uh, analyze this year's data in real time to see what the impact of hybrid learning was, right? So that we can figure out what else we have to do to adjust our practices to keep those kids from falling behind. Because the likelihood, at least in mathematics, is that they will fall behind. It won't be as dramatic as what we saw when they went through remote learning, um, but they will fall behind being here every day. Ah. So thoughts or questions? That's the fun stuff. That's the stuff I like. Because it tells you so much. Um, Are there any questions either from board members or from uh, the public? Any comments? Okay, um, I don't hear any. Let me see. Okay. Um, I don't hear any. Uh, someone needs to put something in the chat if they actually tried to say something. Um, all right, so next we have a consent agenda. Thank you, Lane, for all those presentations. That was appreciated. So uh, we need to approve the minutes from our October meeting. Are there any changes or substitutions, additions, deletions? I make a motion we approve the minutes as presented. I second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Um, next, we have the superintendent's report. Um, Lane, do you have anything to add or um, sort of highlight about your report this month? Uh, not unless there's there's questions. Like I said, I spent a little bit of time trying to detail out um, a little bit about the the budget pieces. They were just so small. Um, it didn't make a lot of sense to you know make the presentation a lot longer. Um, but that would be the only thing that I would point out to make sure that people you know check that out. You're on, on board with that. Oh, the, the facilities and grants piece. Um, this was actually really good. Um, the work that the facilities crew has been doing, um, just 
so folks know, you know, we've received a considerable amount of money, almost $300,000 in grants this year because of their work. Um, the 102,000 um, that was received to do the E911 E911 work, that's uh, making sure that uh, any phone in this district, if somebody calls out for emergency services, it shows up the room number um, when they pick up so they know exactly where to go. Um, that was an incredibly expensive changeover. It was mandated by law, but we, we got enough in the grant um, funding um, because of the work that facilities did to pay for about half of it, um, which was really good. And then because of their work, we did receive uh, another 174,000 um, in coronavirus relief funds to help out with the HVAC systems, make them more efficient, move more air. Um, which I thought was really good. So there are people doing it. So paid paid for their salaries and then some between those two grants. Any questions for Lane on his report? Okay, we also had um, director and principal's reports in our agendas and uh, a financial report. Is there anything you wanted to highlight or bring to our attention about the financials? Financials are good. Um, know where they're expected to be at this point in time um the auditors are doing their job as well they're going through um, they spent the last they spent about what a week in the week in the building and then they're doing a lot that's remotely um, at this point in time their yearly audit we had brian do our board evaluation tonight brian Uh, mostly um, fours and fives. It was well attended both by um, you know board members and the public. Thank you for uh, whoever's left. I don't believe there's probably too many, but um, um, I did give a, the a three to the board, a three plus, I guess, to the more the meeting proceeding without interruptions or distractions. It was long discussion, very very good discussion, but it did uh, drag down on the time wise. But everything else was pretty good. Um, on the back again, it's mostly fours and fives. On the one that I can kind of pin to something that happened tonight, but uh, good meeting. Thanks. Probably in our agenda planning, we should a lot more time for public discussion, and I think that would clear up some of our our bad grades on uh, on our board evaluation. All right, um, next we do have an executive session. Um, we have personnel, student issues, and also the superintendent's contract to discuss. So board members will move out of this meeting to another remote link. I literally just emailed it to you. So. For a discussion. Um, thank you everyone else for attending and um, do I have a motion to move to executive session? Second? All right, so um, we will uh, thank you all for attending and we will uh, enter executive session. I make the motion. A second. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Hey. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Get some sleep. <laughs>